happy Mother's Day. Welcome to Silverdale. My name is Beth and this is my husband Alex and this is our sweet youngest boy Colby. We thought we'd bring him on for Mother's Day because we are dedicating him and our oldest two sons in the service, which you'll get to see in a second and we're really excited about that. Um, and we're just so grateful that you're here to worship with us this morning. Yeah, and don't be fooled. I know we have this whole happy family vibe going on. We just put this together just for the 60 second yeah. frame. <laughs> Most of the time it's it's screaming and messy and yeah. uh, at home it's happy and angry and, and, and sad. So like I know this this is not reality. Yeah. Right? Uh, and a lot of people when they hear happy Mother's Day, so they don't always feel happy. They feel anger and they feel sadness. Yeah. And the thing about our omnipresent God is that he can meet you wherever you are. So when someone says happy Mother's Day, feel however you feel and then let God meet you there and he'll give wisdom and strength and peace if you allow him to meet you. So happy Mother's Day. Well, moms, today is your day. It's a day to say thank you for loving us, caring for us, and guiding us. It's a day to recognize all you do and all you are to us, your perfect, wonderful, amazing children. Thanks for all the early mornings and for taking care of the things we take for granted. Thanks for never giving up on us, even when we stress you out. Thanks for making sure we have what we need and for giving us your heart even when you're sick and tired. Thanks for working hard even when we're a handful and for loving us unconditionally when our attitude is anything but lovable. You're our everything, Mom, and we'd be a mess without you. Today, we thank God for the wonderful gift of you. Happy Mother's Day.
Welcome to Silverdale and happy Mother's Day. I'm so glad you're with us in worship today. And hey, if this is your first time, my name is Michael and I have the privilege of serving here as the online pastor. And I'm so glad that you're joining today. I really hope that today's worship really just inspires your faith, helps you to draw near to the Lord and just causes you to know him better. Listen, this is Mother's Day and we have a very special part of the service planned in just a moment. We're gonna have a baby dedication or a child dedication. We haven't done this in over a year because of COVID, but today during the service, we're gonna join with a number of families as they dedicate their children to the Lord. And this is just them saying, hey, we have these wonderful children we love, and we're gonna do all that we can to raise them before the Lord and our opportunity to pray for them. And I'm so glad that we have this opportunity to join them in worship together. Glad you're here. So now everyone, if you uh, take a seat, very special day in the life of Silverdale Creekside since it's our first baby child dedication that we've ever had here at Creekside. And so I'm so excited, so honored to have many of you with your children here, those special chunks of heaven with us. So uh, most of you on the front row, I'd like all of you on the front row, moms and dads with your babies to stand right now, if you would. And like Allison, John, why don't you come over here a little bit so you can kind of be closer. A few of our band members having babies, they don't just sing, man, they have babies too. So. It's pretty awesome. Now, Psalm 127, the Bible says that children are a gift from the Lord. As a sign of God's blessing, all right, your children, God's blessed you. And with every gift and blessing, there is a responsibility for you. As parents, the Apostle Paul instructs us in Ephesians that you're to raise your child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, you don't raise this child for your ambitions, your desires, you raise them for the kingdom of God. Now, how does that go? Well, the Bible says you're to train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's mature, he won't depart from it. That's a beautiful promise of God's word. You train them in this book here, they will stay faithful. So that means through your love, encouragement, and discipline, you'll mold and shape that child that you have there with you. The Bible also says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. So it's your job to get the foolishness. Now, I can't see much foolishness here, but I'm not with them 24-7. So, but your job is to get that foolishness out of them. See, and that means you're going to say no when it's time to say no. You be the parent. Then, as a parent, you must say yes to your child. May they see yes in you all your life. So you're the greatest influencers. Now, but you can't do this in your own strength. Today's parent-child dedication begins with your personal surrender, mom and dad. You see, the, we're dedicating the child, but really we're dedicating you as a parent to those precious gifts of God for you. So, see, we live in a society that promotes me only. Now, there are many times in your life as a parent, you're going to have to sacrifice even to the point of exhaustion. Although your child smiles at you, there are not a lot of thank yous during those diaper changes and late night crying, feeding, times of sickness. You see, the only way that'll work to do what God's called you to do, if you're surrendered to God. 
as your father. As you walk with Christ, he'll help you and empower you to rear that child in the best way. So this would be a beautiful thing. What if one day your child, as they grow up, says, my mom and dad are the godliest people I know. That should be a goal for you. So now I'm going to ask all of you parents to make this commitment to Christ. I want you to repeat after me. You ready? I choose to live my life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And with God's help, I choose to be the godly parent my child needs. Now, if God's given us tools, particularly these two tools to help in the commitment you're making today, the first tool is the Bible. And in your gift box, if you haven't seen it yet, you'll get, we have a children's Bible for each one of our children here today. See, God's word must be foundational to your lives individually and in your family time with each other. Make it a priority to get in the word daily. And as you rear that child, let them see you in the word of God, not just on Sunday, but in the word daily. See, the, because the Bible is not just a history book. The Bible is God's word and it'll transform your hearts and lives and their hearts and lives. Now, most, most of you know my story. I didn't have the blessing of having a Christian home here with godly parents. And as you know, a, a couple from Tennessee Temple Seminary led me to faith as a young boy, and they gave me a Bible that I treasured. Little did I know that Bible would be a lifetime of seeking God and be the formation of me going into the gospel ministry. So you never know the power, the transforming power of God's word. But also God's giving you prayer. I want you to see this. This letter you'll have in your box is a letter that I've written. And I hope one day to see some of you show me this letter as your child commits to follow Jesus one day. And that letter just says that, hey, on this date, we dedicated you, your parents dedicated you to the Lord. And so it says we as a church family prayed for you. So that letter represents the prayers of your child. So your personal surrender with God's word and your prayers, I believe God's going to accomplish great things in a child's life. Now I want to lead you in a prayer of surrender and dedication of your child to the Lord. As you either hold your child or place your hands on them, I'm going to be praying. I'll be saying he or him. Of course, you have a girl. You can change it to she or her. And some of you have both. Just say both. Now, for this prayer here, would you repeat this after me? It's a prayer to God. Father God, being the parent of this child in the best way I possibly can, I commit my life provide for his needs, to shield him from the destructive ways of Satan, to teach him all the ways of God's word, and to love and pray for him all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as the redeemed body of believers, the literal church family that all of us here are for these precious little ones, I'm going to ask everyone else in the room here to take a part by committing to pray for these little ones. And some of you are grandparents, friends, but all of us are the body of believers, the family for these children. So this is what I'm going to do for you. I want you to do for me. I'll have you express your commitment to pray for them verbally by doing this. I want you to do it so even the youngest one here can hear as you bless them. So now while all of our families here, you turn around and face the church family. This is your church family. You face them. Some, you're facing some of your parents, grandparents, your family members. Now, church family, what I'm going to do, when I read the full name of the child, I want you to do this. I want you to join me in saying out loud, we bless you, the first name. For instance, if there were someone here 
with a little baby Chuck here, okay? Who, wait, who wouldn't want a baby Chuck? Come on. So anyway, if there were a baby Chuck here, I would say Chuck Patrick. Then I would say, and you join me, we bless you, Chuck. All right. There's a supernatural power through scriptures of the blessing. So, as I say this name, you follow me, and let them hear that blessing. Allah Boatman, we bless you, Allah. Hollis Finley, we bless you, Hollis. Andy Livingston, we bless you, Andy. Colby Livingston, we bless you, Colby. Liam Livingston, we bless you, Liam. Brooks McMasters, we bless you, Brooks. Liam Morgan, we bless you, Liam. Aaliyah Patty, we bless you, Aaliyah. Ellison Squires, we bless you, Ellison. Gracie Wilkie, we bless you, Gracie. Hallelujah. The power of God's blessing, church family. You're there to support each one of these precious moms and dads. Now I want to pray a prayer of blessing over them. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, for these precious moms and dads that you have blessed with these gifts of heaven, God. Treasures, Lord. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, for your strength on each father, each mother here as they rear their child in the nurture, the instruction, the admonition of the Lord. I pray you give them patience when patience is needed. But I pray you give them strength, guidance, peace, Lord. I pray that child will one day say, the most godliest people I know are my mom and my dad. So Lord, for each precious little one here, I pray for your anointing on that child. I pray, God, in the strong name of Jesus, that we would see incredible lives out of this body right here, God. May that girl, as she grows up and follows Jesus, may she be a mighty warrior, a princess of the Most High God, Lord. May she touch the world for your kingdom. I pray for each little man right here as they raise him and he comes to faith in you. I pray, God, that your anointing be on him so that he lives out and speaks out the gospel of Jesus to transform this world. So, Lord, we as the redeemed body of believers join together in this blessing. We thank you for your blessing, God. Now, we take responsibility to support these parents to love them, encourage them, and encourage these children as they continue to follow you. Thank you, God, for what you are doing, what you have done, what you will do. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, they're going to have to be dismissed to nursery, their families where they're sitting, whatever. So let's praise the Lord for each of our families and their children. Thank you, each of you parents, for the honor for me to have this part in your life. So, also, of course, as I said earlier, this is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers. And that's why we chose this day, because what a perfect day to recognize these precious gifts of God than through the mother. And so, what I want to do here is to honor you. Here's the thing. There's no way we can truly express our gratitude for all of your blood, sweat, tears, and prayers in raising us and loving us. But I want to do this. And I heard this. I want to give this quote. Um, I found this. A mother is she who can take the place of all others, but no one can take her place. So if you're a mother, or maybe you're a surrogate, a spiritual mother, all of you please stand with me as we honor you stand. I want to pray over you. All mothers here. If you're an expectant mother, you stand. So I want to pray over you right now. 
Father God, I thank you, Lord, for the gift of mothers, God. In your divine design, you set it out that the mother would bring us into this world. You did it with your own son, the incarnate Jesus, Lord. You could have easily just made him appear, but God, you chose him to come into this world to be our Savior through a mother. Lord, I thank you for each mother represented here, each spiritual mother. Lord, I pray for your blessing and anointing continue on them, God. Lord, may you let them know how much you appreciate them through your blessing in their lives. Lord, and I pray, God, that their families recognize, not just today, but every day of the year, their contribution to their family, our lives, our church, our world, God. Thank you for the gift of motherhood. Thank you for each of these sisters of mine, these precious mothers. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Let's praise the Lord for our mothers. Now, if everyone, we would stand as we continue in worship. Let's just declare that through every season, we will lift God's name on high. We will bless him. We will choose to rejoice in him. So sing this out. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails would not fail me now.
Well, today is such a special day, and just as Chuck prayed over mothers, I think it's so important that all of us remember that God wants us to leave a legacy on the people's lives that we're in every day. So as we sing this, we, we just want to bless you. We want to bless you with his favor, with his presence, and that you would leave a legacy on those around you for Jesus. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Come on, just seal that this morning, sing amen. Amen, 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 amen.
let him hear you this morning. blessings, these promises would be fulfilled in our life, God. That we would praise you and worship you and glorify you as we see our children and their children glorify you and worship you and come to know you. And God, that is our prayer for those around us, all of us, even if we're not parents, God, that those around us would come to know you, would come to salvation through knowing you, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your forgiveness, your love, your grace, Lord. Would you fill our hearts with joy and peace today? God, would you bless us with your peace today? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Silverdale Baptist Church and happy Mother's Day. It's so good to see all of you here worshiping with us today. I'd like to welcome all of you at our Bonnie Oaks campus, those of you at our Creekside service, North Udawa, St. Elmo, and all of you worshiping online. I'm Tony Wallace, sir, one of the pastors here. I have the privilege today to share with you God's Word. So this is what I encourage you to do. Go ahead and take your Bibles and open up to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 19, Matthew 19. And then you can take out that Bible app as well and open to Matthew 19. And also, we provide these Bible study outlines for you. So I encourage you to follow along and take notes as we study God's Word together. You see, we're in a series called Red Letter Words. Jesus' words are often written and read in the Bible. And so what we're doing is we're looking at these big topics that Jesus taught on. And so far, we've seen Jesus' teaching on worry and Jesus' teaching on money. And how do you love hard people? And, and we've, we saw last week, how do you forgive people? Jesus has taught on all that. And today, we're going to talk about Jesus' teaching on marriage. Jesus taught a great deal on marriage. And so, let's turn to the owner's manual of marriage. It's the Bible. And it's found in Matthew chapter 19. Look at what Jesus teaches about marriage. It begins in verse 3. Jesus is accosted by these religious leaders and they want to know how do you what about marriage and divorce specifically look at it verse 3 some pharisees came in order to test him test jesus they asked is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason they're basically saying hey you know what marriage is hard we're looking for a loophole jesus what are the loopholes can a man divorce his wife And so what does Jesus do? Jesus goes to God's original design. He goes to the created order found in the book of Genesis. And look at what he says in verse 4. Jesus answered, haven't you read that from the beginning their maker made them male and female? That is God's original design for marriage. One man, one woman, male and female. Now I know that in our culture today, there's a lot of confusion, right? Everybody's got all these different ideas about gender. In fact, you know, in New York and California, they recognize 31 different genders. There's male, there's female, there's bigender, there's transgender, there's gender bender. I'm not going to list them all, but there's a lot of confusion out there. God says, no, no, no. When it comes to marriage, there's no confusion. God has a created order, one man, one woman. And then what Jesus does is he says, how do you take these two people that are so different, male and female, and make them one? He tells you, look at it in verse 5, and said, for this reason, a man will leave 
his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. This is God's word to you. May God bless it as we read it, study it, and then obey it. Amen? Now, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Jesus' answer to this question about marriage and divorce. And you go, well, why were they asking that question 2,000 years ago? The very same reason that these Pharisees were looking for a loophole in marriage and divorce back then is the very same reason that people, you know, look for it today. Because, let's be honest, marriage can be hard. Marriage comes, goes sideways sometimes. It becomes difficult sometimes. I don't know if you've recognized this, but you know what? Your spouse is different than you, right? And it's hard for two to be one when you've got somebody that's so different than you. In fact, you've probably noticed this, that you've probably married somebody that's a little opposite of you. Why? Because opposites attract. But then over a period of time, opposites don't only just attract, opposites attack, right? I mean, the fact is, is that what happens is, is that sometimes opposites attract. I mean, that thing that initially was just so attractive, oh, it's so cute, it's just so adorable, he's so laid back. And then after several years, you go, I can't stand this guy. Would you get off the couch and get a job, right? <laughs> what, what you thought was so adorable, opposites attract, suddenly opposites attack, right? Or, or you know what, maybe it's some um, your personality and, and, you know, some of you are very punctual. And, you, you know, you're there on time. And there's others of you, you know, you're sort of more flexible with your time. Some of you, when it comes to money, some of you are savers, Right? And there's other, you're real conservative with money. And then some of you, what? You go, saving? You can do that? I didn't know you could save money, right? Opposites attract, opposites attack. And then what else? You know, some of you are very organized. And then others of you, you know what? You're sort of more creative. You know, well, not everything's got a place, right? And so what happens is, is that, and that's just one idea, but the reality is, is that many times marriages go through these seasons of struggle, opposites attract and opposites attack, and we, we often look for a loophole just like the religious leaders were in that day, just like people do today. And so how do you follow, okay, this is God's design, how do I follow it? And so I want you to jot down three things on your outline today that just help you what Jesus teaches on marriage. And it's this, number one, first of all, you got to have the right design. You got to have the right design. Jesus goes to the original design, right? Jesus says, hey, you got to have the right mindset. You got to have the right concept when it comes to marriage. Because if you got the wrong concept going into marriage, it's not going to work. Again, what was the concept of the Pharisees? Verse 3, some of the Pharisees came in order to test him. They asked him, is it lawful for man to divorce his wife for any reason? I mean, they're looking for this loophole, right? And they had the wrong mindset and design when it comes to marriage. Now, there are three different approaches to marriage. In our culture today, there's basically three different approaches. And what I, on your outline, I've sort of put a box there for you to look at the three different approaches. And the first two are incorrect, and then there's the biblical approach. So jot this down. The first approach to marriage is what I would call the casual approach to marriage. The casual approach to marriage. And that's basically, you know what? I may get married. I may not get married. Marriage is really not that important, you know? I mean, besides, goodness gracious, it's just a piece of paper. And generally, whenever you have a casual approach to marriage, you then have a casual approach of the things that are typically in marriage. Like what? Like sexual intimacy. And that's why you have in our culture today, you have people that say, you know what, what people, you know, consenting adults do in their bedroom, it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's, it, they're not hurting anybody. And so they got this sort of casual approach to those things that are in marriage, right? And so what happens is the majority of our culture, before they get married, they'll move in together, right? And they'll say that the, the rationale is, hey, it's, it's, it's more convenient, right? We get to share money, and, and we're sort of practicing. We're sort of, you know, just testing things out. So we're going to live together first. Now, if you're in that situation, you're, you're cohabiting with somebody outside of marriage, I'm not here to embarrass you or anything like that, but I am here to tell you the truth of what God's Word says. You see, if you have a commitment, and you say, okay, I've got this commitment, and we're going to move in together, but I don't really have a real, real commitment that we're going to get married. And so what are you doing? You're just sort of practicing, right? You're doing those things that are reserved for marriage, and you're doing it outside of marriage. 
And so you come together, and what do you do? You, you get your, um, you know, your toothbrush, and you put it in the toothbrush holder, and you take your clothes, and you, you put it in the drawer, right? And, and what do you do? You, you share bills, and you share an address, and you share the bed, and those are things reserved for marriage, but you're sort of doing them outside of marriage. And does it work? No, it doesn't. See, here's the deal. 80% of those who cohabitate end up breaking apart, okay? So, so everybody thinks, well, this is the way it's supposed to be done, but it actually doesn't work. 80% break apart. In fact, what's interesting is that because you've sort of practiced the wrong way, then whenever you go, oh, I want to really get married, I want to be serious now, I've met Mr. Right or I've met Mrs. Right, now I'm really wanting to get married, right? And so you say, I'm really serious now, I'm, I'm taking marriage serious, I'm going to get married, right? And then what happens? Well, like any other marriage, what happens? It, it hits rocks. I mean, it gets rocky at a certain point. And so what happens? Well, you're going to bail on that marriage. Can I tell you something? That those that live together first are twice as likely to divorce. Do you know why? Because you practiced the wrong way. You were in and out of relationships. It was casual. And so whenever, even when you're trying to be committed, guess what? It falls apart. And in fact, it gets worse than that. To those that have cohabitated first, 80% more adultery in those marriages than those outside. You see, this is not God's design. And so whenever you go outside of God's design and say, okay, I'm just going to have a casual approach to marriage, it's going to fall apart. There's a second way that people approach marriage, and it's this. Not just the casual view, it's the contractual view. The contractual view of marriage, basically look at marriage as sort of a contract, right? I mean, you, contracts are a good thing, but, but they're basically built on mutual distrust. You, you've entered into contracts before, right? You, you get that loan or you, you buy that house, and what do you do? You sign the bottom line. And it's basically built on mutual distrust. I'm not sure if I can trust you, but here's what I'm willing to do. Here's what you're willing to do. And if you live up to your side of the contract, then we'll be fine. And so a lot of people go into marriage with a sort of contract kind of view of marriage, and they go, okay, these are my expectations, these are your expectations, and if you sort of meet my expectations and I meet yours, then we'll be fine. But what happens? Well, again, sometimes the marriage goes sideways. You know, you don't meet my expectations. I feel betrayed by you, so I'm done. I'm out of here. And so you sort of dissolve the relationship, and that is why 50% of marriage is in a divorce, because they have not just a casual view, but they have a contractual view of marriage. Well, there's a third approach to marriage, and it's a covenantal view of marriage. You see, the Bible calls marriage a covenant. I mean, in fact, the last book of the Old Testament, God calls marriage in the book of Malachi a covenant. You know, a covenant, what is that? That means it's based on mutual, unconditional love. That I'm going to love you the way God loves me. In fact, in the Bible, the word covenant, it's a Hebrew word called brith. It means to cut means to cut. And so what does that mean? Well, well, the idea is there's always a shedding of blood whenever there's a covenant. And so in the Old Testament, what they would do is that they would sacrifice a lamb or a, a bull or whatever it is, and they'd cut these animals, and then they'd separate the pieces, and they'd create an aisle between all of these cut up pieces of this animal. And then the two people that were going to enter into a covenant, they would walk between these cut-up pieces of the animal. That's where we have the center aisle. Even in marriages today, you've got a center aisle. That's where it comes from. It's, it's the cutting. It's the beginning of a new covenant. And so what you do is you, you walk through this sacrifice, this blood, and then you stand before God and each other. You make vows and promises, and you say, I am going to be faithful to you. I'm going to unconditionally love you. And you're going to blow it, but I'm still going to love you. Before God and before others and before you, I am making this covenantal relationship with you. And if I break it, may what happened to these animals happen to me. Now, what does that mean? That means that whenever things get difficult, you don't bail. Whenever the other person doesn't meet your expectations, you don't bail. You, you say, you know what? I'm going to love this person the way God loves me because I made this covenant vow before God. And things get tough, but I'm sticking it out. That's what the Bible says. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says in a marriage relationship, a Christian marriage relationship, we are to love one another the same way that Christ loves us, with a sacrificial kind of love. That's the kind of love we're supposed to have for one another, is a covenantal kind of love. And so the proper approach to marriage is not a casual approach to marriage like our culture does, but no, it is a covenant before God. But there's a second thing that I want you to see, not just the design of marriage, but now let's talk about the right devotion in marriage. 
you've got to have the right devotion and love in marriage. You go, yeah, of course, I'm going to love my spouse. Well, you need to love somebody before your spouse. Look at what it says, verse 6. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. In your Bible or outline, circle the word God there. You see, what Jesus is going to teach us, not just here but in other places, that our first love is not our spouse. Our first love is God. Now, a lot of us are like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love God. I love God. But what I need, I need to find the one out there that I love, right? Have you heard people say that, right? They're looking for the one. You may have this girl that runs up to you and goes, oh, my goodness. I just met this guy. He's so cute. He's amazing. Oh, he's so funny. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I get tingles all over. I think he's the one, right? Right? And isn't it crazy that just a few months later, the one that just made your heart flutter is the one that drives you crazy, right? And you're like, hey, you know what? Mr. Perfect that you saw a few months back, and now you got a restraining order on him today. Why? Because you thought he was the one. And so what's happening is we have an entire society, and, and every, you know, every movie on Hallmark is somebody trying to find the one, Okay? And so what's happening is so many in our culture, they're delaying marriage, and they're always on this search, always looking, always looking, always looking, trying to find the one. And yet we're less successful in relationships than we've ever been. Can I just tell you, God has a better approach for his people. And what is that? Well, notice in Matthew, I mean, Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is asked by the religious leaders another question. Look at it, Matthew 22, verse 36. It says this, teacher, which is the greatest commandment? of the law, Jesus said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And so what's the greatest commandment? You and I are to love Christ, love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus has to be the one. Jesus has to be the love of your life. And only whenever you've experienced the grace and unconditional love of Jesus Christ in that relationship will you be able to then love yourself and then love one another. That's the only way. you got to first love Jesus, and then in that relationship will you be able to really love yourself and then love others the way that they need to be loved. You've got to find the one. Jesus is the one. Okay? Okay? You got to find the one. For you to be happy in life, you got to find the one. Jesus has got to be the one. I would just love one day for maybe a young man to run up to me and say, oh my goodness, Pastor Tony, Pastor Tony, this girl, I just met this girl. She's, She's beautiful. She smells good. She looks good. I mean, she loves Jesus. She's passionate about Jesus. Pastor Tony, I just think I've met the two. I've met the two. Why? Because Jesus has got to be the one, and then your spouse becomes the two. Listen, if you're pursuing a relationship more than you're pursuing Jesus Christ, that is idolatry. Let me say that again. If you're pursuing a relationship more than you're pursuing Jesus Christ, that is idolatry. And that applies to those that are single, and that applies to those who are married. Now, let me just talk real quickly, maybe to the, the singles. I see this so often. And I struggled with it even for a while when I was single. It's like you have this hole in your soul and you're just on this search. Are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the one? Right? And and you always think, okay, I've got to be in this relationship, not in a relationship. I'm not happy. I can't be fulfilled. And so, you know, I see girls go from one relationship to another thinking that this guy out there is going to satisfy what they're really looking for. Or some guys are the same way. Oh my goodness, it's Friday night. You know, what am I going to do? I can't stay at home. Oh my goodness, right? I've got to, it doesn't matter who it is. It's got to be somebody. I'll go anywhere just to find somebody, right? To be with. Listen to me. Jesus has got to be your one. You need to ask the Holy Spirit to dethrone the idolatry of relationships that you're always pursuing. That's the single folks. The married folks, it's the same for you. Because so many times, this is what I see, that you get married and you start looking to your spouse as being the one. As though your spouse is going to be the answer. As though your spouse is going to be the one that's going to make you happy and fulfilled. Many times when a marriage isn't working, part of the reason why is because you're looking to your spouse to meet needs that only Jesus Christ can meet. And, and guess what? They can't do it. I mean, you know, when the marriage is great, you go, oh my goodness, you're so wonderful, you're so beautiful, you're so incredible, you're the one, right? 
And then whenever marriage starts falling apart, what do you do? You go, it's your fault. I ought to be happy. I'm not happy. And it's got to be your fault. And guess what? In any relationship, if you're looking for faults, you're going to find them. Why? Because we're a bunch of sinners. Can I tell you, you're married to a sinner. You're, you're, in fact, the person you're married to is such a sinner, Jesus had to die for them. That's what a big sinner they are. But I'm not happy. It's got to be their fault. Well, maybe you're looking to your spouse to provide things that, you know what? They can't provide. They can't meet those needs for you. And so quit pointing to your spouse as being the, the problem or the answer to all your issues. They're not. Whenever things get tough, what do you do? You don't point to each other and go, it's your fault. No. You grab each other's hand and say, let's go to the one, Jesus Christ. He's the only one that's going to solve this mess that we're in. He's the only one that can heal our hearts. I'm very thankful in mine and Susan's relationship. She doesn't look to me as her one because I am a poor substitute for Jesus Christ. And I can't look to her to be my one. She's a poor substitute for Jesus Christ. We've got to look to Christ. He's the only answer. He's got to be your one, and then your spouse is your two. Now, in fact, look at how Solomon puts this in Ecclesiastes 4.12. He says this, A cord of three strands is not quickly tore apart. Now, you understand how that works, right? To have a braid, you need three strands. So you got the husband, you got the wife, and then you have Jesus Christ. And you weave those three together, and Jesus Christ is in the center, and what happens? Suddenly, it becomes a strong braid. It's not going to fall apart easily. Now, is this just preacher talk? No, it's not. All the statistics bear this out to be true. In fact, let me just show you two statistics of divorce. The first one there is one in two. That's the divorce rate in America, 50%. One in two marriages and in divorce, okay? Now look at this second statistic. One in 1,015. See that? One in 1,015. You go, what's the difference? The difference is those are married couples that are Christian who regularly worship together and pray together. Have you heard it before? You know, the, the family, the marriage that prays together, stays together. It really is true. It's not just some religious talk. No, it's all the difference in the world. Between basically 50% ending the divorce or that statistic of 1,015 to 1, that's a crazy statistic. Those are people that make Jesus Christ the one. Why does it work? Because this is God's design, folks. And so if you want marriage to follow Jesus' design, okay, you've got to have the right design. It can't be just casual. It's a covenant. You've got to find the one, and the one is Jesus Christ. He's the true devotion of your heart. And then there's a third truth, and it's this. Jot this down. You've got to have the right determination. You've got to have the right determination. You go, what's that mean? That means you've got to have the right commitment. You've got to have the right work ethic. Because marriage will not work unless you're willing to work at it. Right? Your marriage is not going to work unless you're willing to work at it. And in fact, the simple truth is your relationship will be as good as you choose for it to be. Now, now, we don't really get this. And part of the reason why is because early on in the marriage relationship, it was so easy, right? You go, oh my goodness, just love came so natural, the relationship came so natural, it was so easy. Yeah, that's the way all marriages start. It's called the honeymoon stage. But then what happens? Then opposites attract, opposites attack. And so suddenly you have, you move from the wonderful stage to the war stage. Oh my goodness, you get on my nerves, you drive me crazy, you're not meeting my expectations, and that's when most people bail. They're like, ah, forget it, I'm done, I'm out of here, right? Well, if you will move to the third stage, which is my marriage is work, guess what? Your marriage will become wonderful again. So what does the marriage work look like? Well, Jesus tells us, look at it in verse 5. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. What does that mean? That means that underneath Jesus Christ, your spouse is number two, right? Your spouse is the priority of your life underneath Jesus Christ. See, the Bible says that you leave and then you cleave, right? So what does that mean? That means that you leave all the other priorities of your life 
They come underneath your spouse. Yeah, that job comes after your wife. Your kids come after your wife. That pursuit and that dream comes after your wife. That, that new house, it comes after your wife. Everything falls underneath your spouse, right? And then that takes work, folks. Okay, I've got to die to me, and I've got to, you know, serve my spouse, and I've got to leave, and I've got to cleave. I've got to do this hard work of marriage. But if you will leave and cleave, God will give you a promise. And what is that? Oneness. And the two will be one flesh. God creates oneness. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. And what does that mean? That means that God's working for oneness in your marriage, and you need to quit working against God. You see, some of you, God's trying to make your marriage one, and you keep working against God. And you may be here, well, Pastor Tony, it's different for you. I mean, you're married to Miss Perfect, Susan. And she's pretty wonderful, but can I just tell you, she's not perfect. Or you know what? She's married to you. You're a pastor. You're Mr. Perfect. Well, I can tell you right now, I'm not Mr. Perfect. And the reality is, is that our marriage has had really hard, difficult times. We've been married 37 years, and we've had difficult times in all 37 years that we've been married. And can I tell you, my schedule is just as crazy as your schedule. And so we had to work hard to make time for each other. And the spiritual attacks on our marriage are as great or greater than anything you experience. Why? Because Satan knows if I can take down that preacher in his marriage, I can destroy thousands of people. And so look, we have these difficult times, but God has taught us, you got to work at it, Tony. And so Susan and I, we have a daily time. We have a weekly date. Every quarter, we get out of town just for our time. Every year, I've been married 37 years. I can write courses on marriage. Every year, Susan and I do a marriage course together. In a month, we're going away on a marriage retreat for a week. Why do I do that? Because I know I cannot take this thing for granted. I got to work at our, my marriage. And if you'll work at your marriage, it will be wonderful again. So quit taking your marriage for granted. Quit taking your spouse for granted. Start working on your marriage. And if you'll do your part, God will do his part, and it'll be beautiful, and you'll be one. Now you may go, but I don't feel like it. I just don't feel it. I just don't feel like it. I don't feel like this hard work. Well, let me ask you, where else in your life, when you've made a commitment, can you just say, well, I'm not going to do it because I don't feel like it, right? Think about that. I mean, can you do that with your kids? I don't feel like feeding the baby. Forget it. Let him cry. No, of course not. You can't do that. I don't feel like going to work. I'm not going to go to work for the next three months. I don't, because I don't feel like it. I'm not going to go to work. Or you know what? I don't feel like paying taxes. Forget it. I'm not paying no more taxes. Can you just bail on those kind of things? Of course not. You can't, right? Just because you don't feel like it doesn't mean you can bail on it. No. You may not feel like it, but you say, God, give me your strength. I'm clinging to you. You're the one. You're going to fill me with the power and love that I need to love this person that I don't feel like loving right now. And can I tell you, if you'll do that, God will create something beautiful in your marriage. You see, your marriage is like a garden. And gardens can be beautiful. And gardens can produce such incredible fruit. But you got to work at it, don't you? I mean, if you ignore a garden for several weeks and you go out there, you're going to see it's all covered up with weeds, right? You ignore it for a couple of months, you're going to go out there and go, oh my goodness, this is a disaster. It's just going to be easier to plow this thing under, right? And start over. That's what we think with marriage. But you know what if you'll do? If you'll just take a couple of days a week and go into the garden of your marriage and just do a little work, guess what? It's going to become so beautiful, so fruitful. It's going to be the most amazing relationship you've ever had. In fact, here's the principle. Jot this on your outline. Your relationship will be as good as you choose for it to be. You've got to make the choice. You've got to make the choice. Jesus is pretty clear. You cannot have a casual view of marriage. You can't. It's a covenant. You've got to determine that Christ is going to be your one. He alone is going to give you the life and the love that you need to love your spouse the way they need to be loved. But then you got to work at it. Your marriage relationship will be as good as you choose for it to be. What's Jesus' teaching on marriage? For this reason, 
A man will leave his father and mother and cleave and be united to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. They are no longer two. No, in God's eyes, they are one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. That's Jesus' words for marriage. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you so much that your words, Lord, they go against our sinful nature. They go against our culture. But God, you design marriage, and we believe that it will be blessed. And so God, help us to respond to you and be blessed in our marriages. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Alex, what a powerful uh, message on marriage. Thank you, Pastor, for that. Listen, before you go, I have a couple of announcements that I want you to hear. But before I say those, if God moved in your life today and you made a decision as a result of that, I want to encourage you to respond as the Lord is calling you. Don't put that off. Take the time right now to respond as the Lord is leading you. And listen, I'm here as your online pastor in whatever way I can be for you. So let me know by going to silverdalebc.com slash connect, and I'll follow up with you very, very soon. So this Mother's Day service is over, but the content is not. Mm -hmm. Our women's ministry has put together a video for all of our moms out there celebrating um, all of you. It'll be on our Facebook page, our women's Facebook page. And also, if you can remember this link, it's silver, silverdellbc.com slash women. We'll be putting a video out there this afternoon celebrating all of our mothers. We hope it's a blessing to you. Yes, and next week, there's another very special service. That's what we're calling that Baptism Sunday. You know, COVID has kept a number of people from being able to come together to be baptized. And that's something Jesus calls all of us to do when we put our faith in him. And if that's your story, if you've put your faith in Jesus, if you've accepted him as your savior, and you have not been baptized, we'd love for you to participate in that service next week. And so the way you, the way you become involved in that is you go to silverdalebc.com slash events and sign up. And if you do, I would love to have the opportunity to just follow up with you and have a conversation around your baptism and even maybe even be a part of that. That would be super special to me if that would be a desire of yours. Well, so those are some of the things we have coming up this afternoon and then next week. Hope the service has been a blessing to you. Keep walking with Christ.